how did how would they know absent records what went into those boxes that are on the taxpayers return so when we're talking about most inquiries remember that the burden of proof is on the government there are ways in controversies to shift the burden of proof uh, the burden of proof some taxpayer there's ways to shift the burden of proof to the government and how do you do that you cooperate you demonstrate with the records that you have what would be allowable, and you otherwise provide credible evidence of what the what the deduction is, right? And in those rare circumstances, we can shift the burden of proof to the taxpayer. In most cases, that's not going to be relevant, and you're not going to need to do it because if you've been credible and you provided the proofs, the system is designed to settle the cases. So preparation is the key for settling cases and avoiding the trial that most of you would like to avoid. Right. Now, if you're not in 274, there are court cases that allow the estimates, that are allow corroboration, and that's called the co -handling. So whenever you're involved in audits and in um, appeals and in tax court cases, um, reject the premise that the mere fact that you don't have 100% proof means that you don't get the deduction, right? The Cohen rule allows you to provide for reasonable estimation of deduction. So you have to have some evidentiary base. You have to, have, right? And that's the problem in the marijuana case. Where is John, right? The problem in the marijuana audits is what? Everybody's high. <laughs> the problem in some of these cases is, you know, before the IRS asks the question, right, the first question they're going to ask, they ask you is, you understand that you are engaging in a business that is illegal federally and we could use all of the answers to prosecute it. And then they ask you questions about your defenses after they've given you your Miranda orders, right? So, which gave us fine lines. Which gave, well, that, so the, and that's the point, right? There are cases where people have, have tried to prove what the cost of goods sold are um, through expert testimony, right? Expert testimony in most of these cases, whether it's the marijuana business or any other business that you're looking to corroborate, using the Cohen rule requires good source data. But if you have good source data, Right? and there are facts that the expert can rely upon in coming to their conclusion, you will be able to get the court to employ the Cohen rule. And that will apply in legal source businesses and in illegal source businesses, because what is the goal? The goal is always to get to the correct tax. Apply common sense. If all other businesses in this area have a 10% profit margin, having a case where you have a 90% profit margin for the taxpayer makes no sense and is as unjust as uh, allowing no deduction at all, right? So, okay. So, estimates have to be reasonable, estimates have to be proved, it all comes down to common sense. Every, whether you're doing a tax return, whether you are representing a taxpayer in exam, whether you're in appeals, whether you're preparing for a tax court case. Look at the return, look at the documents, look at the story, does it hold together? That's what you need to know to represent the taxpayers in these cases where the books and records are not perfect. That's how what you call substantiating the deduction or the expense. Apply common sense. There are exceptions to this rule of estimates. Right? And they are where Congress has said the documentation needs to be better, right? And that's when we talk about 274, which is the heightened substantiation requirements. Charitable contributions. Charitable contributions is a fraud area. So they're above a certain amount that we're going to talk about. You need to have a contemporaneous written acknowledgement. The donee, the donor has to acknowledge receipt of the gift. Over another amount, we're going to have to have qualified appraisers. 
Why? Because Congress has decided that these were abuse areas, that taxpayers were exaggerating. All right. Dependency exemption was another area where, in the past, well, you know, now that's gone, but in the past, what was happening? Why, why was the IRS litigating so many dependency exemption cases? <coughs> because both husband and wife were claiming the, the dependence, right? The number of cases where the Social Security was, number was claimed on multiple returns is what caused you know, the, the, the rules on the need for the 8283s. Because the IRS was spending an inordinate amount of resource time on very small adjustments because the cheating was too big. Real estate professionals is, is also one of those areas. So the, why the cheating was too big is the first section we're gonna talk about, alimony. Yes? 288, automobile expenses. Okay, that's My it. Idea. Yeah, people hey, will that's cheat. On, that's on the hit list this we're, year. It, we're gonna get to all of them. These are all of these areas that are enhanced substantially. <clears throat> it's areas where taxpayers were thought to be abusing the system and public policy said, look, let's just change the statute because it's costing us too much to enforce the statute. And one the, the first example of that is the alimony deduction. I don't remember, if, when we, we talked about this um, during class, GAO came out with a report and said there was, the, uh, the government was losing in excess of $3 billion a year for paying spouses, paying alimony and taking a deduction, and receiving spouses never reporting the income. Never matched. Really but they never matched. They never matched. So the IRS was getting involved in relitigating the divorce. What did the parties intend when they made these payments? The husband is behind on the payments. So were the first payments alimony or were the first payments child support? Or there were the, the lawyer who drafted the matrimonial agreement may have been a great matrimonial lawyer, but he put in provisions in there that were inconsistent with the deduction for alimony. I mean, it, when we were studying for the exams every year, one of the areas we went over, and there were lots of cases every year, about whether or not a payment constituted alimony, whether or not the payment constituted uh, child support, was the payment equitable distribution, right? All of those had different tax consequences, and the reporting was inconsistent among the parties, right? The paying spouse would be deducting what was legitimately alimony. The paying spouse would be deducting as alimony child support. The paying spouse would be deducting as alimony equitable distribution payments. On the other hand, the receiving spouse was reporting nothing and taking the dependency exemption, head of household, and the earned income credit. <laughs> So from, from the government's point of view, the, the reporting by the parties, the husbands and wives who were separating and divorcing, left a big hole, right? And the GAO was at, it said it was at least $3 billion of tax a year. So Congress solves the problem. And how did we solve the problem? We got rid of the deduction for everybody. <laughs> Good idea. Not if you one that's paying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but so what's going to happen? Payments uh, uh, going forward, both sit section 71 and 215 have been repealed. Right? So for Agreement. Now we have a year to learn this. So agreements executed after December 31, 2018. Alimony will no longer be deductible. And the receiving spouse will no longer be including it. Right? So it's a net nothing on the return. And why do we need a year? Because you have to refigure all of the tables and charts that decide 
how much to order and how consequences were very important. Right now, by denying the deduction, the paying spouse is in essence paying as much as you know forty percent more. The receiving spouse is receiving it tax free. How it affects other things like earned income credit are going to be right because now the receiving spouse is no longer has the income on the return. Do you got all these other issues? What is providing more than half of the support going to be? I mean, we need it here. There are five cross sections in the in the materials. Yes, there's five cross sections that change, right? Because the dependency exemptions now change, alimony changes. And there's lots of things that were keyed to who supported the child. And those have all changed. Well, in some ways, we don't have to worry about the, the exemptions anymore because those are gone. But somebody had a question? OK, yes? Now, I want to make For seven, yes. Nothing has changed for 17. Though you're doing returns, right? You're, it's 18. You're doing returns for 17. Nothing has changed. We have even agreements that are in the works that are signed now before 2018. Nothing has changed, right? Because they've already been negotiated. You've been to mediation. You think we want to send everybody back to matrimonial mediation to recalculate all the numbers? No, we're given every the Congress has given everybody a year to figure it out and debate the tax consequence into their negotiation. All right, but it is a dramatic change for all any of you who are advising matrimonial attorneys. This is a dramatic change of the landmark, and I'm telling you, you should be doing draft pro forma returns because the combination of this and the change in the way the dependency exemptions is going are going to give you some surprises, right? Yes? Clarification there, if you would. Does the decree have to be issued by the court prior to December 31st, and then it's still deductible in 1920, or does it terminate? The agreements that are signed prior to December 31st, 2018, you still get the benefit of the old law which I feel so bad to the Internal Revenue Service because there's no related information reporting. So how are they going to know? If somebody takes an alimony deduction, how are they going to know if it's an old agreement or a new agreement? Right? I could see, like, we're going to leave that last number blank in the agreement and on the time. We're going to copy it a million times. Of course it was an old agreement. What are you talking? Oh, the ink is wet? No, that's just the copy machine ink. Uh, no, the, the, okay. I, I can see problems in the exam because you don't have an information reporting mechanism that will tell you the correct date of the agreement for the alimony, but that's going to be one of the issues that they're going to look at on examination when you're preparing for your examination. If you've got old and cold alimony on your tax return, then you're going to make sure that you have the agreement in the file. When you are preparing the return, Come on, get, find out what the date of the agreement is. Because I know a lot of you are going to get pressure to, to talk to the alimony going forward. I'm like, what do you mean? I paid all that money, I don't get a deduction. I mean, the states are saying, like, we're going to turn our, our state and local taxes into charitable deductions. Why can't we do that for alimony, too? <laughs> so. Right? The, big, the worst thing about this argument on state and local taxes is we're now turning our state and local governments into tax protesters. These 16th Amendment arguments that they're making are the same arguments that the tax protesters make, right? That, that income is defined differently under the 16th Amendment back then, and now we're going to redefine income for the 16th Amendment. So, but in any event. So, Again, there is, and I'm not going to go over all the questions tonight, but they're in the materials, but there is, on almost every exam, there are questions about alimony, child support, uh, and equitable distribution. Except last exam. No, this is from the 2016 exam. 
That's why you must have got that one wrong. <laughs> it was him. It wasn't Al. I'm sorry. I, I said I was going to be kinder and gentler this year. But <laughs> everybody's going to pass this year. What? 2016 S11. <laughs> and they're going to ask you about. You know, what was alimony? What was child support? Is it alimony? Does it comply, right? And going forward, that's a trick question. Right. There's no deduction for the alimony. There's no inclusion for the alimony. Yes? It, uh, I think the statute also deals with, the new statute deals with modifications. I can see how a motion by uh, one of the spouses could really cause havoc because, uh, or in one case, a client had a, a as a, uh, uh, an option to buy a house and he can either accept it or otherwise, but it'll be after the deadline. So I just wonder if that's going to be a source of real anxiety. The, the best thing about the new act is it's going to keep us all working. Right? <laughs> Don't leave home without your tax professional. It's got to be our new motto. <laughs> It doesn't upset her. Change is good. We like change, right? <clears throat> Especially new change, right? I don't know if you guys track the passport revocation stuff, but commercial for passport revocation. The IRS is starting um, this month certifying the debts to the State Department, and you know the. It was originally thought that the Internal Revenue Service was going to certify debts on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, we learned today, right, they, it was published in the IRM and the IRS press release, they're going to be certifying debt every week. And the ACS is going to be certifying debt. So every taxpayer that owes $50,000 or more who hasn't made arrangements Right, that's not in an IA, that has, doesn't have a 71, uh, 122 offer and compromise, who hasn't, you know, currently not collectible, is going to be subject to passport revocation. Yeah, but Frank, yes. Not everybody's got a passport. Is there any other document? Sixteen states now, right, have driver's licenses that do not qualify for TSA. So the loss of that passport isn't only going to mean international travel. The loss of that passport for the people in those 16 states are going to mean they can't get on a plane in the domestic United States. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> so the, the the next it, well, if you the 2016 decimal for the Internal Revenue Service said there are 14 million cases in the collection division right now. I don't know, and the report doesn't stratify how much, how many of those 15, 14 million cases are above 50,000 or less than 50,000. But if we're going to be certifying cases every week, passport revocation should become the full employment act for all of us in the collection division very soon. But back to you know, the, the 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 new law keeping us all working, we should be very thankful. <laughs> because well, one, it's going to be it's complicated for the internal revenue service, right? Because you're going to audit history. So, it, it, say you're auditing two and three years, so you're going to have different rules on alimony in the first year, in the second year, in the third year on your dependency. Some year you're going to have dependency exemptions, and all of a sudden now they disappear. There's no dependency exemption anymore. Same thing. This 199A. John just taught his nice course. Right on the, the choice of entity, everybody's going to be readjusting. Everybody's going to say we we're entitled to the deduction now. So there'll be lots of work for us. Medical and dental expenses. One one good thing uh, that's changed. Right, um, medical and dental expenses. There are lots. Of, uh, I don't understand why there are so many trials on medical and dental expenses. But you've got to substantiate your medical and dental expenses. You've got to actually have paid them. You know, if insurance reimburses you for your medical bills, and lots of people have insurance, right? We have we have the Affordable Care Act. We have uh, employer-provided insurance. There are still lots of people that will deduct 100% of the EOB, right? 
and never report the reimbursements. Um, so, you know, one, to be a medical and dental expense, an out-of-pocket expense, you actually have to have paid it. Uh, coming into tax court with just a list of unpaid medical bills doesn't carry the day. So, you've got to pay. The change to the new law, it's gone down from 10% of your AGI uh, to 7.5% of AGI in 2017 and 2018. But then, like everything else in this law, something sprang back, right? In order to make the GAO numbers work, that the, the bill only cost a trillion and a half, you've got to have deductions that phase in and phase out. So for 2017 and 2018 years, your computer software should be checked, right, that it's 7.5% of AGI, right, which now, if alimony is no longer included in your AGI, is a benefit for the spouse who has the children to then take the medical expenses, right? When we're looking at drafting alimony agreements and child support agreements as who's going to pay what, right, now you're going to look at the thresholds and say, hey, if the person with the children has no taxable income, then allocating and having them pay the medical expense just means that they're going to get the deduction. The government is now a partner in taking care of your children. Isn't that nice? Uh, no, but again, that's how you have to think about it. You guys look at returns, and you're looking at planning. So now you're seeing this is the change in the way our income is all of these AGI-driven deductions have to be revisited in light of the new changes to what is or isn't in your AGI, in what entity you choose to port back down to your return to, to adjust your AGI, to adjust your planning. That's why I'm saying the new tax act has lots <coughs> of planning opportunities that we need to assist our clients on, right? Because these new mismatches provide tax deduction opportunities. Yes? I have a question. In the tax court the other day, they had the, he paid a lot of medical prescription mm -hmm. from another country. And I always, I wasn't sure what was the right answer. He but had a it, prescription. He had the prescription, even if he bought it in another country, then it was, he could pay the deduction. Did it heal him, right? I mean, and that, that brings us to one of the cases that the volunteers did. Larry Senecantra tried as a volunteer. It was this woman had paid $50,000 to faith healers. It was Ricky, right? So the, the woman paid, well, that kind of, the woman had curvature of the spine. Went to traditional doctors. <coughs> And the doctors had said that she was going to need the surgery, and a 50% chance uh, that the surgery would, she'd end up in a wheelchair. That wasn't the most palatable choice. So the woman went to a specialist, faith, what we, I, I pejoratively called faith healing, right? Because it's, it's electric energy and, and touching of the hands. And that the, she believed that the touching, that the, that the faith, the energy transferred is what cured her back. And the woman did believe. I mean, that, there was no question. Judge Carluzzo found she believed. And even me, who I don't believe anybody, <laughs> thought she believed. The counsel attorney said, you know, maybe if you had taken a theft deduction as opposed to a medical expense deduction, we, we might have been more inclined to allow it. But, so he didn't believe. He wasn't a believer. But it, what's the test for the medical expense deduction? The sincere belief that the expense is directed to cure or mitigate a disease, right? It's a subjective test. So what I might have thought was not traditional medicine isn't the test. The test is, did the taxpayer have a sincere belief? And the taxpayer in that case got on the stand and, and she had a sincere belief. 
and the judge found her to be credible and therefore allowed the medical expense deduction. So we're not substituting our value judgments when we do the medical expense deduction. We're not even substituting the judgment of the insurance company because in this case, in the case that went to trial, the woman submitted all of the expenses to the insurance carrier and the insurance carrier said, no, this, this treatment is experimental. It's not traditional. We're not going to cover it because we do not find it to be ordinary and necessary and we will not reimburse. That, the fact that they didn't reimburse doesn't end the quest for the deduction. The question is, <clears throat> did the taxpayer believe? And those are the arguments from when you prepare the return, through appeals, through your tax court trial. Is your taxpayer worthy of belief? Is the story credible, right? In this case, the woman did pay over $50,000 to these professionals. And she at least, or once she believed she was better, and in that case, she walked. <laughs> when you had you know, doctors saying that she wouldn't. So that was enough for the court. All right. So next, state and local taxes. What? You want to do marijuana first before state? We don't need the marijuana to do the state and local taxes. It's not going to be so bad. I mean, you live in New Jersey. How many of you really have real estate taxes of more than ten thousand dollars? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> It was, what? Well, not a joke. I live in Costa, New Jersey. Nobody in Costa pays $10,000 in taxes. Come on. What about your income tax? You pay those? We'll be making charitable donations. I mean, shouldn't I? I did that once when I was 18. Did I need to do it again? Uh, that was the defense in one of my cases. One, one of the rappers, right? That was Jeff's client. Jeff's client. He paid taxes when he was 18. And nobody told him that it was something that he had to do on a yearly basis. <laughs> what? Oh yeah, and he tried to and he tried to deduct his marijuana as a medical expense. Uh, what? Did he sincerely believe? Yeah, but can he? Did, look, we're gonna ask John. John, even if you sincerely believe, can you deduct your marijuana as a medical expense? No. no. Even, even if you have, even in a state where a pharmacist hands it to you, like Pennsylvania, you still can't do it. You still can't do it. It's a Schedule One drug. The federal government still treats it as an illegal substance, a prescription. In a, in a, as he said, in a state where it is legal, is irrelevant. There is no deduction. So then you don't have to report the income. <laughs> <laughs> Self-help. Article 60, or Section 61, from all sources derived. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, let's go. So in uh, current law, before, before we go to the freeze, right, it's right now your state and local taxes are deductible. Your real estate taxes are deductible. You look at your nice Schedule A in New Jersey, that ends up being what drives a lot of Schedule A's. But it also drove alternate minimum tax computations as well, right? So what have we done now? There's a $10,000 cap on your state and local taxes and your income taxes. So, and that's it, right? There's, you're going to start reading about lots of articles on school districts are setting up foundations and they're going to, you're going to make a charitable donation to the trust and you're going to get a credit against your real estate tax. And you've been reading it in the Bergen Record. There's three towns already in Bergen County that have set up these trusts and the whole thing. That's a quid pro quo. It is not going to work. You guys have seen the private letter ruling. It's the, that was an outlier. I am predicting it will not work. 
to those of you who do it, your clients will probably get into a negligence penalty situation. Stay away from it. We have a, a law that was specifically designed to cap state and local taxes. To the extent that these workarounds are done, it is trying to do indirectly what you can't do directly. In other words, the substance is going to override the form, and I anticipate that the Internal Revenue Service will audit the issues and that there will be penalties. Just avoid the discussion. I mean, eventually, in two years or four years, they'll change it again. Yes? With the 10,000 cap, is it still the same that you would need to take the sales tax or the income tax in trying to get to the 10,000, or you could take both? It's an aggregate of ten. It's an aggregate of that. It's a block of ten grand total. Okay, so you can get to the ten thousand. You can do sales tax plus state It's a cap. It's not a limitation. I understand it's a cap. It's a cap. You know when it came under the old law, you either are the higher the sales tax. Well, the higher the income tax, and that, 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 that did not change. That's what I read. What are the other? It's, it's sales, or, sales or income plus real estate. Okay. Up to 10. Okay. What yes. are the other? One, okay. one point not mentioned. Uh, foreign property taxes are no longer deductible. Right. That's, that's correct. <laughs> real estate. In taxes. case you can get to 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get it, right? It, again, that's that's why I'm going to commend you to the actual the materials and the statutes to, to look at the actual language of Section 164 because those things have been changed. There, it, look, it's a hard stop. It's going to be a ten thousand dollar cap. It's it's designed to be a limitation on it. On that, you know, the only area you're seeing is people are trying to change the under. Okay. The other the scam that may not be upset, and this is you're seeing a scam, and it, this is an old scam, that people are trying to convince taxpayers to move their homes into partnerships and then charge themselves rent and take the, the state and local tax deductions on the partnerships. Again, no, that's stupid. No, the, I've seen it already. Stop. <laughs> Stop. The last set of return preparers who put together these family limited partnerships for taxpayers' homes, and most of the taxpayers ended up being public servants. They were cops, they were firefighters, they were teachers. The return preparers, <coughs> father and son, were both indicted. Okay? So it was a conspiracy to commit tax evasion. The, the, Taxpayers who were public servants, some of them were prosecuted and lost their jobs. Okay, so to the extent that people are saying, hey, let's just convert your personal residence into a family limited partnership and you should charge yourself rent and then you get the benefit of your Schedule 199A exclusion, right? You're converted. I, you can't, I see this stuff and it's crossing my desk and I'm like, you know, maybe I should let taxpayers do it because there will be all this litigation that we're gonna do. But, and other pe people who aren't in this class, they could do it, okay? But all of you, don't do it. it does, it's not gonna work. Yes? Even if it did work, by doing so, you would be, Get, you'd, you'd be risking, you'd lose the exemption for when you sell the house. People aren't worried about that, right? That, and that, that's, I mean, that's, that's big, probably that's the big But what people, the, the literature that we're seeing, right, is one, it's, they're circumventing the state and local tax because now you're deducting the tax on the entity return. Two, because of 199A, the income, you're taking your income that you're paying at, on one rate and you're reducing it at another rate by combining, you know, putting right. that income into the the other right. entity. So I guess it, what I'm saying is, even if you could make it work, I think that a professional would need to have a letter in his file to the client 
disclosing, you're going to probably lose that exclusion. When you no, the letter should say you are going to jail in one <laughs> That's what the letter should say. I'm not even accepting the premise that it could ever be allowed. Again, those who repeat, who you know, fail to learn from the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them, right? People went to jail the last time they tried this scam. The result won't be different this time. Sure, will. It's a new tax law. <laughs> <laughs> Case law starts off. Yeah. Yes, Jen. Well, how is that different than because uh, you you advised um, on a on a December one of your December seminars about changing your LLC to a C corp. That way, you can stick your uh, your IR your retirement in there and and take loans from it. Okay, so because that's what the code that won, and because that was choice of entity, right? And that's the difference in, in you look at the different entities and you look at the rules that allow for the entity. What C corporations allow for defined benefit plans and defined benefit plans in C corporations are allowed to lend the participant up to $50,000 and owners who work for a C corporation are still considered employees. Right. See, that's the difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion. That's using the existing laws, complying with the laws, and availing your client and yourselves of the benefit that results from those laws. All right, versus, right? So the substance conforms with the form, right? You've got a business entity, you're gonna take the consequences of the C-Corp, the potential two law, two uh, types of tax, but you're going to take the benefits, right? The 105 plan, where in the C corporation, if the only employees of the C corporation are the owners, you can have a plan that provides for 100% uh, payment of medical expenses for employees. <clears throat> in a C corporation with a 105 plan, those medical expenses are deductible from dollar one. Do we have the 7.5% limitation? No. So that is, that, that's understanding and taking advantage of the provisions of the code as Congress has directed them, right? We don't ever challenge Congress's wisdom in doing it, right? We're historians, we're planners. We look at the rules and we advise consistent with those rules. Right. Yes. Uh, does the, with C corporations, you have to be careful as, as to revenue, for example, retirement income is okay, but do you have the personal holding company rules to worry about? If, if, sure. If you don't throw out the money? If you, so you're again, in the fast, same place otherwise. Okay. One, that, that's true. But two, you know, most of these one person, two person corporations, we never have to worry about accumulated earnings tax. We never have to worry about personal holding tax, right? The whole thing is to zero out the income by paying it to deductible expenses that don't have a corresponding inclusion on the shareholder level. For example, right, the 105 plan. You get a deduction at the corporate level of the medical expenses on the inclusion on the wage earner. The, the same, so there are lots of those mismatches in the code. So what small business owners look at are for you to advise them of those mismatches and then when they work, right? For a while, that's why people will buy long-term care insurance in C corporations, because 100% of the long-term care insurance was deductible on the C corp, and then the inclusion and the money when it came out was not taxable on the individual level, right? So that was a mismatch that was authorized by the code. Sometimes it's a deferral, right? That the C Corp provides for a deferral, like the pension plan, and that the money comes out. The small legitimate captive insurance company that provides for the deduction and the inclusion. To the extent that the form and the substance are consistent with the benefit that Congress enacted, then the tax court has been very, very good about allowing taxpayers to take advantage of mismatches in the code. 
Where it goes wrong is where you try to do something indirectly. And usually it involves a lie, okay? That you've got a, a partnership, that you're putting your personal home in there and you're using it as your personal residence as opposed to a business property, right? That is a lie that people change. When, whenever you have to say that the address is different, you, you go through, like the, the, lots of the cases we see at the calendar call, there's a, a, a married couple, they're actually living together, but the preparer has told them, you have to use different addresses on your returns. Why are they telling them that? Because they're both taking head of household, right? And you can't be in the same household. So the fraud starts with even the address that you're putting on the tax return. To the extent that you need to tell a lie in order to get the tax benefit, you're not entitled to the benefit. And when we're talking about substantiating deductions, that lie is going to result in you not being entitled to the deduction. Yes? Yeah, Frank, what about the idea that somebody said, and I think they meant it in jest, but if somebody actually takes them up on it, of contracting with your neighbor or a friend or somebody for a house, and uh, having, you know, a business, uh, running a business by uh, renting out and, you know, all the associated thing going with that. I mean, if somebody actually did that, would But it's that the work? secret agreement. It's the reciprocal. It's the <clears throat> benefits and burdens. Is it a real transfer? Or is there some side letter or side agreement that, that stops the loss, right? That's the difference. If the substance and the form coincide, then the tax benefits will follow. On the other hand, to the extent that there's a lie, and I put the side agreement into the category of lie, right? If there's something that you can't tell your tax preparer about, that there's something that you can't tell your IRS auditor about, then you're probably not entitled to the deduction, right? One of the things, when we talk about Circuit 230, and then I gotta get back to the materials. Circular 230 says one of the things you can't consider in doing tax planning and filing a return is the likelihood of audit, right? Because the likelihood of audit doesn't change the bona fides of whether or not the position that you take on the return is true and correct. When you're preparing a return and you're advising on a tax strategy, you have to assume a 100% chance of audit. And would you prevail in that audit, right? Would, and, if, and this, the ethical standards don't even require you to prevail. Is it more likely than not? It's not a shall. That, or is there substantial authority, a 40% likelihood of success on the position? Or if you disclose the position, you make adequate disclosure, is there a reasonable basis? Reasonable basis being defined as a one in five shot at trial of winning, all right? Then you could even do that. But if you have to tell a lie in order to be successful on the position, or if, you're, if you need the fact that the IRS audit rate is less than 1%, to justify the position that you were taking on the return, then you shouldn't do it, all right? That's what ethics is. And ethics is what raises the profession, uh, the standards of a profession that give you respect, that let your clients come up to the next step and grow in society, right? That's what we have to teach. We have to teach voluntary compliance and self-reporting. We have to teach following the rules is how businesses become more successful. All right, so back to, so next, what, what's happened? Also, always examined, and it is the mortgage interest limitation, right? So there were lots of audits involving people taking an interest deduction for more than a million dollars, right, of principal. Why? Because we're in New Jersey, right? And there are lots of houses in affluent neighborhoods, especially in Bergen County, New Jersey, that sell for a million dollars or more, and everybody borrows 100%. So, right, nobody has any equity in anything. So, so you, you, they were big mortgage deductions. And apparently, 
Lots of return preparers and TurboTax users were knew how to get around the limitation on the million dollars of principal and deduct more than the million dollars of principal to generate the interest, right? That's why we had so many examinations. And then you've got the, whether it was, the, the issue was whether it was um, acquisition indebtedness, whether it was home equity indebtedness, all of these complicated rules on interest. And so during the bills, there was lots of discussion. What are we going to do with the interest deduction? Are we going to get rid of it? Are we going to bring it down? I think one act had it going down to a half a million dollars. They were going to get rid of this interest on the second home. Maybe we can play with home equity loan interest. So the settlement ends up being we're entitled to acquisition indebtedness on a qualified residence. The residence must be secured by a mortgage, and the loan has to be enforceable under local law. So what did they change? One, a million dollars? We didn't go up, we went down. So now the principal is only on the first $750,000 of interest is deductible. Uh, second, what else did they do? The home equity loan is gone, right? Remember we had the extra $100,000 of interest deductible on the home equity loan? That would be gone, all right? So those are the changes that were made. Uh, again, acquisition indebtedness occurred incurred before 2017, you can still deduct the interest. Again, so now back to the audits. It used to be a holy cow in Washington, D.C. All these uh, congressmen always say, so it was always... It's still a holy cow. How many states have in excess of the 750 when they scored it? It's only like five states that eat up most of the interest deduction above 750. So it wasn't a big give other than the five states that are using most of the deduction. Um, so the, again, back to the old and the new, right? The old debt is, is grandfathered. So you don't have to go out and tell your clients to refinance everything. Right? So to the extent that their mortgage was the million dollars before December 31st, 2017, you could still deduct the interest on that debt. And eventually, you know, that interest is going to get paid down. We're going to, that, that issue is going to go away. But the, the new mortgages are going to be 750000 What if and you have a, no, you have a, no primary mortgage and you just have an equity mortgage? It's got to still meet the acquisition indebtedness or, so the, the home equity just alone is probably not going to meet it because it's got to be acquisition indebtedness or a refinance of the acquisition indebtedness. So just, you know, backdating your mortgage to get to your million dollars as of December 31st, 2017, it's probably not going to cut it. Plus it's not recorded and it's early January, so it's too late to do. But is it, is it a part of an acquisition debt? If it was part of acquisition debt, then it's deductible, right? Part, you know, acquisition debt is, is one, it, it's been litigated quite a bit. What is acquisition indebtedness? But it was if it was genuinely part of the acquisition indebtedness, which includes the, the home improvement uh, changes, then you're going to get it, right? You'll have a building permit. You'll have something to prove that the debt is tied to the expense, right? Um, so, but what did you lose? You lose the home equity deduction, right? That is now done. Is that, um, is that grandfathered? The debt, yeah, I think everything was grandfathered as of December 15th, 2017, and everything goes away, right? We go back to the million dollars in 2025. Like, again, you, you got to hope that things will change, and there'll be another 7 before 2025. Yes? Frank, uh, 
TD Bank sent out a notice today that for three and three quarter percent home equity loan, come into the bank and take a home equity loan. I, in reading the section on uh, interest, I think that they're going to need some kind of a definition of home equity indebtedness because some people, when they refinance, they got a lower rate by taking a home equity loan with their they redid their acquisition indebtedness. But again, the, before the seventh. But they, that's been litigated, right? That that there is case law on if it was bought, built buy or substantially improve the first or second home, then you meet the definition of acquisition indebtedness, right? So it, it, what you call it isn't what's important. What you did with the money ends up being what's important. If it went into the house, then it's going to be deductible subject to the limitations, right? And subject to basis, of course. But um, if it didn't go to us, if you took the home equity money and you went to Atlantic City and you lost it betting on red, right? That's not going to be deductible. Suppose the refinance for just the same amount, but it didn't take any extra out, just one of the lower rate. Then you're still at the same. That's okay because that's 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 still it's a, you know they it is still used to buy, build a substantial improvement. That includes the home equities. Yes. So does a refi have to then be connected to an improvement, or does a garden variety refi? A refi of the existing loan is still okay. If you modify your mortgage because you want a lower rate. That interest, that principle didn't change. You still get your deduction, right? What, what the whole part th of the refi process, they, re they reassess the value of the house. Okay, and you take out more money? Yeah. Then the you're problem. done, you're not getting it. That's the problem. For any of it, or just for the part Any of it. Yeah, they didn't use it. Did you, you, did you use you the money to buy, cash build, cash or substantially you improve the house? No. If it cashed out? No, it's always not the value. It's not deductible. So the entire thing would then not be deductible? No. Just, no. just the, yeah. the cash yeah. out. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why these audits are such a pain in the butt. And I don't know how, right, again, there, there's no information report. On the, the 1098, right, that the bank sends you, they're going to have to change and add another box that says, what year did you take this mortgage out? Otherwise, the poor IRS people, you know, they're going to be audited. And unless they look at the mortgage and do the calculation, how are they going to know what the principle is that the interest should be assessed on? Isn't the origination date already on there? Yeah. On the 1098? That was part of half. Yeah. Okay, so I'm sorry. Then I, I missed that it's on there already. Did you change that all last year? No, not half. I hate half. But, um, so again, the bi binding contract exception, your grandfather, if you've got the debt prior to December 15th, 2017. Yes. Um, what, what else are we gonna do? Ability to, to phase out, you know, points and mortgage, um, th those really haven't changed much in the new act. Uh, cases, now what happens? If, you, if the bank forgets to record the mortgage. No deduction. It's got to be secured. We had, again, the volunteers, we, that was one of the tax court calendar call cases. Even if the bank makes a mistake and doesn't record your mortgage, then you don't get your interest deduction. It has to be secured by a mortgage, and the prime facie evidence of that mortgage is the land records. You have to check to see if the mortgage was done. If it's not done, you lose your deduction. And you don't have to pay it. Aren't you going to sue the attorney to handle that? You know, who you sue, right? Again, the, who you sue in these circumstances is above my pay grade, right? <laughs> right? You know? <laughs> you know, there's always. They just can't take your yeah, right. right. Well, that's right. If they, if they forget to record the mortgage, they can't foreclose on the mortgage. They would have to sue you on the note. 
Uh, so, you know, there is a, a benefit of this. So, you can't deduct the mortgage if you're not liable for the mortgage. You can't deduct the mortgage interest if they forget to file or record the mortgage. All right, but again, that ends up being questioned sometimes. And cases, the cases that actually show up in the tax court. All right, what's the matter here? Uh, on the exam, they ask this question all the time. Is the limitation per taxpayer or per home? Taxpayer. It's now per taxpayer. taxpayer. That is correct, John. John reads the homework assignments. <laughs> the tax court originally found it was per home. That case was appealed to the circuit. The circuit said that it is per taxpayer, and then the IRS acquiesced. So when you're looking at the home mortgage interest deduction, the limitations apply per taxpayer. So that's another reason not to get married. You can tell your spouse, I mean your significant other, that we could double our mortgage interest deduction if we just don't get married. What other, what better reason to avoid and defer your wedding day? All right. I'm going to quote you, Frank. Yeah, you, can, you can quote me on that, right? I tried it with my wife. It didn't work. But, you know, but, you know anything you can to get a couple of extra years of freedom. Hi, and if my wife is filing from home, honey, I was talking about other people. Uh, <laughs> and this is a perfect time to take a break. Thank right. you, guys. Right. We'll come back. Yes, Howard. 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 Yes, before is the break. There's a change in the POA rules uh, that came out today. We'll cover them all. I mean, they're all of, if you want to go over everything that's tripped out with these services in the last couple of days, yeah, it's yeah. like ridiculous. All right. Thank you. All right, charitable donations. Again, there, there are a couple of seats up here. People are, are standing in the back and they want to sit. There are some seats up front. It's, you don't have to be in the back of the class. Uh, all right, charitable donations. Another area which is a abuse area. Right? Those of you who come to the calendar calls, you will see the cases involving people who take $5,000 donations for close to goodwill, right? And the, the, you know, their clothes actually went up and down because they wore them and they were like really famous celebrities or will be someday. Uh, so, charitable donations. Take a deduction for a charitable donation. You have to actually donate cash or property to a qualified donor. All right? You've got to substantiate the value of the property contributed. You don't get a charitable deduction for the contribution of services. Right? A lot of people say, hey, I worked at day for a charity, so I'm going to take a deduction. Right? No. It's, but you can deduct your out-of-pocket expenses in order to volunteer. So those are, you start with those rules. They seem to be very simple, but there ends up being lots of litigation and lots of questions about charitable donations. All right, changes, before we go through the old. The, the good positive change, instead of 50% of your AGI, you can now give 60% of your AGI. <laughs> right? How many taxpayers do you have that you see that they're t saying that there's 50%, right? They're all, pe everybody's tithing 50%. Now they're going to be tithing 60%. They're not leaving themselves enough money to live. <laughs> but, well, anyone can become a minister today and you could set up your own charitable foundation and now and what the other change so first change is they, they upped the donation limitation two 
no more deductions for college athletic event seating. The Rutgers rule. The Rutgers rule, right? All, all those charitable donations to your college athletic program, those are no longer deductible. I mean, tragic. <laughs> so, how do you substantiate a charitable deductible? You have the question about why we're getting rid of the donations for charitable or athletic organizations? Yeah. If you give Rutgers 500 bucks and as part of the deal, they gave you two seats to an event. The whole thing gets wiped out because you got the seats. Or only you, you modify the 500 for the value of the seats. Okay. What part of, let's, let's look at this. Like This conference sometimes will tell you, you know, the value of and the quid pro quo with the letter, right? We, we're going to go with that when we talk about some contemporary written acknowledgement. But the words that Congress used are no charitable deduction will be allowed for any amount paid in exchange for the college athletic event seating. But that still begs the question, do you lose the whole thing or just a part? Okay, they, are you going to be able to value that? That, that right now, my gut is you're going to lose the whole thing. Wow. All right, because you're going to, and they're going to separate it out. Right? And let's go through the rules. And when you go through the rules and the quid pro quo rules, you'll see it. All right. Um, what do you have to do to substantiate a charitable deduction? All right. To the extent that it's more than 250 bucks, you know, 250 bucks or less, right? You got the check. No big deal. 250 bucks or more. You need what's called a contemporaneous written acknowledgement letter, in Section 107 of the FAA. From the truck driver that picked it up. No. From the charitable organization. Okay. Yes, fake qualified. Yes, I, there has been a number of those that we've come to tax court where the ink is still wet on the contemporaneous written acknowledgement. Contemporaneous actually means before the return was filed. So going to the charity now and saying, can you backdate a letter for me? That would generally be bad. Okay. It, so it, it contemporaneous written acknowledgement. The letter has to include the amount of cash. Next, whether the organization gave the taxpayer any goods or services as a result of the contribution and a description of the value of the services. Okay? So where do a lot of there there's been a lot of cases that have been litigated on what inference do you draw if the letter does not say whether or not the taxpayer received any goods or services as a result of the contribution, right? And one of my cases, our cases, the client got made a $64 million donation. <coughs> the letter did not say that the taxpayer had received anything in exchange for the $64 million. So the return preparer's inference was, if it doesn't say that he received anything, then he didn't receive anything, so he should get the donation, the deduction. Mm -hmm. The tax court, in a case called 15 West, said, if the language isn't there, if the magic language isn't there, that no goods or services were provided in exchange for this donation, then no part of the $64 million was deducted. All right? So that's how important the con reading the contemporaneous written acknowledgement letter is. It, 15 West. Okay, of course, my losers we want to talk about. Uh, and the, um, so there is, the contemporaneous written acknowledgement letter is very important. If it is not contemporaneous, if it doesn't have the magic language in there, that nothing was received in return for the gift, or what they call no quid pro quo, that no part of the donation was a quid pro quo, not one dollar million was a quid pro quo, then you lose the entire deduction.
Frank, I yes. Think, I think there's one, one, there's one other piece that has to be in there, the condition of the Well, that's, once you get over a certain amount of money, it's, the, it's actually the description of the value of the goods or services, and it's you need what's called a qualified uh, appraisal. And we're going to go over it, right? <coughs> so once you go over $500, you have to file the 8283. Now, what's the 8283? It's a form where the donor acknowledges receipt of the gift, all right? And the failure to file the 8283 by the return preparer signed by the donee, again, now you lose the deduction as well. So you have to remember to get the contemporaneous written acknowledgement letter, and it gives it more than $500, you have to do the 8283. And then above $5,000, you need a qualified appraisal of the property, and you need to attach that to the 8283. Mm -hmm. And in, unless you have reasonable cause, the failure to attach or, or obtain a qualified written appraisal will um, preclude the deduction. Right? So the, there is no exception for the 170F8. There is no exception right now for not including the 8283. But in a case called CRIMI, the tax court said that the, the failure to get the qualified written appraisal, if the return preparer uh, made him say, like in the, in, the, in the case of CRIMI, the return preparer looked at the appraisal and said it was qualified. But it, when the Internal Revenue Service audited, they looked at it and it didn't meet all the criteria of qualified written appraisal. The, the return preparer's blessing of the appraisal constituted reasonable cause, and the taxpayer was allowed to take the deduction and then try and prove the value of the gift because there was reasonable cause. Because in the, 80, the statute that provides for the 8283 and the non cash contribution of $5,000 recognizes a reasonable cause exception, whereas other parts don't. Okay. Um, now, most of the cases that are, have been litigated at the tax court calendar end up cases where there's lots of charitable contributions below $500. And then, again, the, the common sense rule is going to end up applying to the value of a lot of these gifts. And remember, the burden of proof is going to be on the taxpayer to prove the value of the gifts. So um, I've put in the materials, from things from the IRS book on how to come up with values. And um, all right, what it is in, in some, and one of the cases this year was a case called Odie, right, that I had a certain put in there. You know, just getting the blank goodwill receipts and putting in your numbers. Everybody does the fact that everybody doesn't doesn't make it right. <laughs> All right, so you get the blank good real receipt and you put in a million dollars. All right, now, are we okay with that? Okay, it's it's the taxpayer's burden of proof. Yes. How would you go about getting an appraisal? Of what? Of what? It depends on it. Everything can be appraised. There are experts that appraise everything. And the charitable deduction area is one of the hardest parts of, of this because as much as we would like it, anyone can prepare their own tax return, right? There is no requirement that a tax professional be hired to prepare a return. The only exception in the Internal Revenue Code to that general rule that we are all competent to prepare our own returns is in this charitable contribution area that requires a qualified written appraisal by someone who qualifies as a qualified appraiser. Right? So there's a case out there called Mohammed where the taxpayer was an appraiser. So he said, why do I need to go pay another appraiser? I'm an appraiser. I'm going to appraise my real estate that I am gifting to charity. And 
in the case that the tax court found that, you know what, this is a really good appraiser. His number was right. He did, in fact, give real estate that was worth X millions of dollars to charity. It was actually low. All right. Did he get the deduction? No. 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 Why not? It wasn't objective. You can't, right. You're not a qualified appraiser if you have a relationship with the taxpayer that doesn't show that you, that doesn't suggest that you would be detached. And so in that case, right, Mohammed teaches us that even if the taxpayer is an appraiser, he or she cannot prepare his own qualified appraisal, right? It is one of, this is one of the few exceptions to the general rule that anyone can prepare their own tax return. That Congress doesn't require the American taxpayer to go out and hire a tax professional to prepare his or her return. And that a person of normal intelligence reading the Internal Revenue Service instructions for the forms <laughs> could prepare any return that is required to be filed. Okay. Yes. Oh, so I'm pushing. Turn. Turn. Home audience needs me. Better. Okay. Um, so again, and why is that? Because the Congress, the Internal Revenue Service, they perceive that there is that this is a big abuse area, and that the abuse occurs in the valuation of non-cash donations to charity. All right. So when you are representing taxpayers in these cases, from the starting of the return through the litigation, look at the documents, right? You want to see the qualified, you want to see the contemporaneous written acknowledgement letter. You want to see the 8283, you want to prepare the 8283, you want to send it out ahead of time so that it can be signed by the people that need to sign the 8283, right? Well, if, if it's above the, the criteria, not only does the donee have to accept the gift on the 8283, but you, the qualified appraiser has to sign the 8283 as well. So it's not something that you could do at the last minute. And then there is a checklist of items in the regulations that set forth what needs to be in a qualified appraiser. You don't have to second guess the appraiser, but you should check off and see, do you have in the qualified appraisal everything that is required to be in a qualified appraisal? And when we go over tax court practice and procedure, that is different than the expert report that we talk about for a tax court trial. Yes? What if it's too good to be true? Again, the, if the appraisal is too good to be true, then you run into the difference between Boyle and neonatology, right? So the, there's the two paragraphs in the cases that are in all of the briefs, right? In Boyle, that it is not for the taxpayer to second guess the professional. When you go out to hire an accountant or an attorney, and you, you give that accountant or attorney all of the facts, then it is not the taxpayer's job to act as the expert. By contrast, neonatology, right? It says that there need, in order to avoid penalties, you need to have three things. One, that the person you hire has to be qualified. Second, you have to provide the, the, the professional with all of the information necessary to evaluate the donation. And then finally, you have to act in good faith, right? So your question, too good to be true, goes into good faith. Well, and it, well one, qualified person. The qual can't be the promoter. Right? Because that will impact on whether this is the person who has the detached interest in order to give you your evaluation. Right? The too good to be true hits good faith. Right? If you wouldn't transfer the property, if you wouldn't buy it or sell it, a willing buyer, willing seller, neither being under a compulsion to buy or sell, then how could the appraisal be in good faith? But that's the factual issue in all of these cases. Yes? 
<coughs> okay. Um, let, let, let's say uh, I'm looking at a, a situation that uh, um, we're applying for a penalty abatement. And okay, the taxpayer doesn't, I mean, has zero knowledge of taxes <coughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, took his return to a tax preparer, believing that tax preparer is, uh, is qualified. So what really, you know, what defines uh, a tax preparer's qualification? Is it by getting a tax ID or by being a, a, an EA uh, tax attorney uh, or a tax lawyer, I'm sorry, or a CPA? It actually ends up being in good faith, right? The uh, Whitsett, there was a case that Jeff and uh, Eugene in the office tried, where the return preparer said that he was a CPA, right? He had a website. Website. He had a website that, in fact, represented that he was. When push came to shove, he might not have been. <laughs> it was on his last test, too. That was Excuse on the 2016 me? test. It was on, right, that was on. Unfortunately, right, and I try not to teach my own cases on the exam, <laughs> except that you know, there's, a, there's been, in the last couple of years, a high number of our cases that hit the exam. With the proof, I, I can tell you why someday. Uh, I don't write the exam. Uh, That's a good but experience, right? In that case, right, what happened is the taxpayer the, the, the taxpayer reasonably believed that the professional was competent to prepare the return. Uh, there was a long-standing relationship of the preparer had done the returns for 20 or so years. The returns had never been audited, had never been a problem before. The taxpayer did provide everything, and the court found the taxpayer credible, as she was, right? She did rely in good faith on her long-term preparer uh, who had been her husband's preparer before he died. So it was a family relationship, a business relationship. So, yeah, that was, yeah, that was that, that's right, that was our case. And so they found that he was, that the, whether or not he was qualified was a subjective test. That the taxpayer had no reason to believe that this taxpayer was not qualified. There are other penalty cases, though where you have an esoteric tax issue, or the, the big ones now are the international penalty cases, where the preparer had no knowledge, had taken no CE courses in the taxation of offshore entities. And in the the government said, if you chose a preparer that was only one step above a you know, big box chain preparer to prepare these returns with complicated international issues, then you should be penalized because you didn't hire someone competent for the task. Again, it comes down to subjective intent. How would you know that the preparer is incompetent to handle the international transaction, right? Even the big box chains have people who, who specialize in the reporting of international transactions today. So uh, in your case, it comes down to the credibility of the client and the credibility to prepare, and um, the court will call both. Yes? So you're saying if the client is credible, fraud of the preparer or the expert doesn't transfer down? Well, does it transfer down into the correctness of the deduction, or does it transfer down into the penalties, right? That's the Finnegan case that we just filed the brief on. In Finnegan, <coughs> as, okay, there's a line of cases that involve the statute of limitation extension for fraud. Right? In the Finnegan line of cases, that those of you who are on the Google group you know, know the case, right? In the preparer, was indicted and convicted for filing false tax returns. Right? In the case, the taxpayer didn't know about the falsity of the return. They believed that this was a preparer who was well known for being creative, but creative within the bounds of the law. 
So we have a factual finding that the tax pay by the, by the, by the tax court judge, that the taxpayers themselves were credible. But the return preparer was guilty. He, the return preparer's deposition transcript came into evidence and he said, the returns I prepared were false and fraudulent. Right, because the preparer had pled guilty, he had a cooperation agreement, so in order to cooperate, his testimony was, all of my clients' returns are false and fraudulent. I prepared false and fraudulent returns for my clients. So what does that do? That extends the statute of limitations for all of the clients. So in that case, we're, we're talking about tax returns that are 20 years old are reopened because the returns were false or fraudulent. <coughs> Taxpayers may not have known that they were false or fraudulent, but the preparer's intent kept the statute of limitations open. Because, and we, we just filed a brief saying that that's wrong, right? Given, but, I was going to say, given the, the, the finding that the taxpayers were credible, it seems inconsistent with the other cases that you mentioned. I got that, but see, that, that's the difference. Where I, we're involved in the case, right? This, actually, there's a pro bono case that I'm involved in that this group was involved. The people who were on the Google group saw the briefs before they were filed, have been involved in the tax court case. So I'm not going to handicap where we are in the case. It's a case out of the Newark office, right, uh, of the internal, no, it's actually out of Manhattan. It's a, and um, there is a split in the circuits on the issue. There's a, the, the federal circuit has said, wait a second, the only intent that's relevant as to whether or not a return is false or fraudulent is the taxpayer's intent. The return preparer, he or she is only the historian, right? They report what the taxpayers tell them to report. They're not liable for the tax, so they're, they're not filing the return in order to avoid their tax. There's a separate penalty regime for bad preparers. You're victimizing the taxpayer twice if you're looking at the taxpayer's fraud, right? And for those of you, some of the cases that we're handling involve taxpayers who filed, gave the taxpayer one set of returns, showing a small refund, and then filed another set of returns with the Internal Revenue Service, showing big refunds. And who do you think got the big refund, and who got the little refund? So, and we have, in those cases, what is the IRS saying? They're going after the big refund, they want it back. Taxpayer says, but I didn't get it, the return preparer got it. They said, it's your return, and you chose the bad preparer. So, we're going to take the money from you, and you go after the preparer that we just put in jail. <laughs> and took his money. So again, that, that's a pro bono case that we in the group are, are doing, that the tax court volunteers are doing, the briefs have been filed. You know, I, I don't want to comment anything that is in litigation other than what we've said in our briefs, right? The our position in our briefs is that the, the return is the taxpayer's return. The filing of a return is a non-delegable duty, uh, that the taxpayer is responsible for the tax, so the statute of limitations should be based on the taxpayer's intent and no one else's intent. But um, again, and that and that will is has been tested before on the exam on whose intent uh, extends the statute of limitations. And right now, the answer is in the tax court. The case, the leading case is Allen, and it, the return preparer's intent to evade tax and file a false return extends the statute of limitations even for the innocent taxpayer. So again, on the exam, they test lots of conservation easement uh, um, on the exam. So we're gonna cover the conservation easements are donations of less than the property, right? You, you donate a, a, 
property and saying it'll never be developed. It'll always be wetlands, right? The property has a mortgage on it. So the, the mortgage has to be subordinated in order for you to get the charitable donation. Why? Because if there's a mortgage on the property and it's not subordinated, then the bank could foreclose on the mortgage and the charitable deduction can be defeated. And that's the key to a lot of these charitable contribution cases, right? To the extent that the charitable deduction can be defeated, then the charitable deduction is not perpetual and it will not be allowed. So there's the Grave case. In, in Grave, the taxpayer had a side letter that said, if the IRS challenges the deduction, then the charity will return the contribution. That contingency resulted in the deduction. Why do you, you give me the nation? Because you want to get some benefits. Yes. Right? That, that, again, see, this is bad because it's another case I lost and it's on appeal, so we don't want to go over too much about it. But yes, I agree with you. The side letter should not result in denying the donation because there's uh, lots of IRS private letter rulings and if the donation is 100% within the power of the government, we would say that it was still a perpetual charitable deduction. But the tax court ruled against them, or ruled against us. So anything that could defeat the charitable donation, as long as the, it's the, the potential for defeating the donation is not so, so remote as to be negligible, will deny, will result in the denial of, of the charitable donation or the deduction. All right? And that's currently the law. But again, stay tuned. We're going to the appeals courts. And we it's not like the first time we've changed some law. Um, we'll give you a hand. <laughs> all right. Next, I, I have to move on. Casualty and theft losses, right? When in one of the other classes we call in, in, casualty and theft. All right. There's lots of casualty and theft law cases. All right. And there's sections in addition to the, the, the donations in 75, I mean in 165. You have to know 7508. Right? And Jeff wrote an article on 70. Is it Jeff and Phil wrote the article on 7508? Just Phil? Phil wrote an article on 7508, which there's lots of provisions of the code that give interest suspension for people that are in um, the, the, the path. Of a, a natural disaster. Penalties for late filing can be waived if the taxpayer was in the declared disaster area. Um, so there are lots of benefits in 7508 that are positive benefits. Um, the, the, co the Congress, um, not Congress, the Internal Revenue Service even have regs that all of the heightened substantiation rules can be excused if the documents that would substantiate the deduction were destroyed as a result of the natural disaster. All right. So the, there was a, in this bill, they were talking about, there's a lot of money in this casualty deduction. Right? Especially this year, we had all these hurricanes. And so should we get rid of the deduction? Should we keep the deduction? What about people who weren't in the declared disaster area, but they also lost money, right? Because everybody used the zip code of people in the disaster area to file their returns in order to take all the deductions. Uh, so what what is happening? <clears throat> all right. So casualty loss, still in the code 165. Casualty and death are still there, but the casualty loss is going to be deductible. Well, it's going to be deductible in the year of the option, the the, uh, the year of the loss. And in a declared disaster area, there is an election that you can make to file it on the earlier year return. So, uh, but what what changed? <clears throat> what if you're not in a federally declared disaster area? You're no longer entitled to the charitable, even if you have the loss, if you could substantiate the loss, if the president hasn't declared the taxpayer's area as a federally declared disaster area, 
then there is no charitable, I mean, there is no casualty loss deduction available. Even if you meet all of the other criteria of the statute, right? The, the, whether or not a taxpayer is in a declared disaster area, um, is on the websites of, um, I forget which agency puts them on, the FEMA? FEMA. FEMA. on the FEMA, FEMA. websites, and you can see <clears throat> going back all of the declared disaster areas. And what I'm told by the IRS is they will look and how, how do they audit it? How do they know that you're in a disaster area or not? It's based on the zip code that the taxpayer uses to file the return. All right. So if you're preparing those returns, make sure that you use the, the address in the zone. Right? Putting the accountant's office, because the house was destroyed. So the house in the zone, you can't use that address anymore. So you're going to use an address outside the zone? The IRS computer's not going to know that. So you got it. How are you going to get that mail? That that's like one of those practical issues that we don't haven't worked through yet. But read the mailboxes in the zone. <laughs> All right, because that's how the computer decides if you were in the declared disaster area or not. Okay. Next, so that so casualty. So that's a big change to casualty deductions. Okay. Next. Miscellaneous itemized deduction. Another time that we spent at calendar calls on examinations, on appeals and audits. The employee business expense, right? Why are you laughing, right? If you're laughing, they're already false. Exactly, <laughs> right. Go next door. If you're laughing, they're already false. But th there are some employees that have expenses that are not reimbursed by their employers and that were on the old 2106s. Right. Unfortunately, <clears throat> that became an abuse issue, right? There were, there were lots of audits by, uh, actually, New York City's audits and they found a very high percentage of fraud on 2106s, on exaggeration on 2106s. Every, everybody's got a uniform for work. Everybody, right? We've had cases where, and I didn't even know what they were, Manolo, Manolo Blonics. You know, that was down as like a work uniform. Right, the expensive, those are the ones with the, the red bottom, right? Or the little batons. Those were on a lot of the tax returns. And the very nice suits and clothing as work uniforms. Uh, wasn't allowable to begin with, but they were always being claimed. Mileage, lots of mileage to and from work. Is commuting deductible? No. Of course not. Lunches. All, all the overdrive is deducted at lunch. All right. All the right, all, all deductions for lunch. There are actually preparers who, based on your occupation, have like pro forma 2106s. Oh, you're a cop. This is how much you must spend on uniforms. You're a teacher. This is how much you spend on supplies. Uh, you're, so, but all of these audits, we don't have to worry about them anymore. Right? Why? Because there's no more 2106. All of these employee business expenses are no longer deductible. Right? Yes? So your suggestion is going to be when you have uh, uh, unreimbursed employee business expenses is to have the employee go back to the employer and set up every day on an, an accountable plan. Well, if, one, if it's an employee business expense, the employer should generally reimburse it. Why? I mean, what you're seeing in a lot of these cases is you've got somebody who's got a hundred thousand dollar W two and sixty thousand dollars on their twenty one oh six. I mean, are you really going to take a job 
that you're going to give more than half of it back on employee business expense. A lot of the 2106s we see at the calendar call, right? You say, when you add it up, the guy who's making $100,000 is making less than minimum wage. They, they make no sense, right? I, again, and I, I don't want to make fun of preparers, but if your Schedule A deductions exceed your AGI, there's a problem with the return. The common sense gene isn't working. Yes? Per diems. The, the per diem people. That's just sad. Congress doesn't love them. <laughs> well, it's, it's like, you know, when federal government employees go to a city, there's a maximum they could spend. If they spend more than that, Congress has said, that's not going to be a, a deductible employee business expense. Right? Congress makes rules. They, you know, all rules you know, draw arbitrary lines. The line now is that it's not a deductible expense, period. In some instances, the employers are gonna have to reimburse or change the way these expenses are paid for. But more, but you know, it's not for us to question the law. It's up to us to address it, right? What, again, what we're seeing already is this stupidity of people asking to go off W-2 and back to 1099 so that they could duck their expenses and take advantage of the 199A. I mean, again, have we all not gone through the difference between an independent contractor and an employee, right? You, you can't, you're not free to change your status if the law doesn't permit that status, right? You're either, I mean, there, there's a test. You're an independent contractor, you're an employee. You can write to the Internal Revenue Service, send them an SS8 if you're not sure, and they'll give you their ruling on whether or not you're an independent contractor or an employee. SS, SS8 is kind of like a invitation for not. You would think that, but no. Uh, the, 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 J, uh, Jacobs uh, said, "Hey, is the SSA the invitation for the examination, right?" And, and maybe you would you would think it, but there there's so many of them filed that people aren't looking at that I I can't say empirically from my experience that every SSA is getting audited. They're not getting acted upon either. The problem is that it looks like there's an 18-month backlog from you and you know that means two returns are already filed. So what good is it done? Um, but uh, on whether or not they're an independent contractor, or employee, the rules are pretty well known, and um, you just have to prepare returns consistent with the rules as we know them, right? But as we know them now, to the extent that you're an employee, your employee business expenses are no longer deductible on your Schedule A line 2106, I mean form 2106, right? Um, anything else on the, oh, what else did we lose, right? Uh, we lose, are we losing the gambling losses? No, no, no. no, no this is what we're keeping, right? All right, so we lost the 2106s. We're keeping the gambling losses, the losses um, from the K-1 box two, and the federal state tax in, in respect of a deceit. All right, so those Schedule A deductions are still there. Yes? Well, the Lynn. Excuse me? Investment expenses are lost. I think we've lost the uh, the investment expense and the deduction for preparing tax returns. I know that's so sad, right? Uh, Safety deposit box. So yes, I know that doesn't mean you don't have to report them anymore because of matching. You still have to report the income from preparing the returns. Uh, yeah, the losses are already controlled by the by the by the winnings. 
All right, so then Schedule C, okay. So then we're, it's time for another break, and then we're going to come back and finish off everything. Thank you. Tax Court puts out the new cases of the debt. Uh, I commend everybody to read the new Tax Court cases of the debt. For those of you, the people who are in the Google group, I read the cases of the day, and I, I try to put on the group for you guys to read cases that I think that are either going to be important to your practice or that could be tested on the 2018 exam, right? So that that's the Google group that I talk about, uh, or or and sometimes we put on the materials about the going to the tax court calendar calls. Are there interesting cases being tried that you may want to watch? Uh, the Google group. If you just want, if you want to be on the Google group and you're not just uh, talk to Jeff. Jeff will yeah. get you on the group. Yes, or Cecil. I was going to say, Cecil can get you on the email. group. Send an email, yeah. and you'll you'll get on yeah. the group. There, you know, there's uh, well, again, it's a, it's, uh, it's also like a listserv. It, it's kind of like a listserv. What I what I tell people is don't ask like, tax protest questions on the group, right? Because not that you don't. You wouldn't ask it. But there are internal revenue service people who are members of the Google group and who will. Sometimes you, they'll post uh, answers to your questions. And obviously, to the extent that they're internal revenue service employees, they're giving you their own personal opinions, not the official position of the internal revenue service. But the questions you ask, you should be respectful because there are people from the government who are on the group. Okay. Uh, and yeah, and then as we get closer to the exam, uh, there'll be a code section of the day, question of the day, based on what we think we need to know to take the November uh, 2018 examination. Uh, to be admitted to the tax court if you're not an attorney. Okay? Um, so let me get back to the material. So again, if you want to be on the group, you would contact Jeff. He'll just put you on the email group. Okay. Schedule C. What, what's happened on the Schedule C, right? That's going to become more important. People are choice of entity because of 199A. And we're not covering 199A today because there's too much to cover. But choice of entity is going to become more important than it's ever been. So knowing wh whether to be a Schedule C, whether you need to do a collective entity, the difference in taxation is going to be important. The first thing that you want to know in <clears throat> Schedule C is this, that's really got to be a business. <laughs> Right? No, again, right? What what is the one of the prepares for the, that we know is, is gonna do some time and call then? You know, the question is, you know, if you didn't need to work this job, what did you always dream about doing? Then all of a sudden your dream business was your schedule C. And then he would have to inform you you really didn't do it that well in your business, you lost a lot of money. <laughs> and it, it, so it <laughs> Fake Schedule C's are obviously bad, it's the, and there are a lot of those. The, what next? Putting your hobby on your Schedule C. Right? It's the, one of the things, and we'll talk about the profit loss rules, but profit motive is one of those things that's frequently tested. It's also frequently audited. So um, the, the primary purpose of the Schedule C is to report a business where you have an honest objective of making a profit. It's not a space where you're just going to make up a business to so that you could deduct those employee business expenses that you feel like it are no longer there on Schedule A, right? Or to deduct your hobby, uh, or deduct other uh, things. All right. So first, what what's going to be tested? What has been changed? Um, Depreciation deduction, you know, and this becomes less important. The theory of depreciation versus expenses, right? Capital assets 
are used for more than a year, so it, in the most part, they would be depreciated instead of expensed. And traditionally, there's been a lot of litigation and lots of questions over whether something is a capital expense that, or a, a capital item or an expense that's immediately deductible. Uh, Congress has kind of made that difference go away for most people in this law, right? First, you got your 179 expense, right? Taxpayers can elect to uh, deduct 500,000 in the old law of property that are placed in service, right? So that's almost immediate expensing for what you've determined. Qualifying property would be the depreciable, tangible, personal property. What you would have deducted, what you would have capitalized can now be deducted. What um, the, the new law changes your maximum 179 expense from a half a million dollars to one million dollars. Okay? So the difference between expenses and capital isn't going to be as important as it once was. How many of your returns do you have? that your taxpayers are born buying more than a million dollars in equipment in one year, right? So you're, you're, you're gonna go to a million dollar deduction from income in year one. That's almost, the, that too, if that's not enough, we're gonna have bonus depreciation Right? Depreciation above what we've used for our 179 expense. And there's going to be a chart for our bonus depreciation in, in the materials. Right? So lots of material, uh, lots of items are going to apply for bonus depreciation. Right? And bonus depreciation, again, there's a chart that's going to cover the percentage of bonus depreciation. So in essence, for the small business, we're ex essentially going to immediate expensing of tangible personal property from the moment it is placed in service. Right? What, what hasn't changed? The placed in service rule. What if you're buying equipment as you're pre-opening it? Well, that, that actually tells the answer, right? If before you start business, before you're open to the public, that you're, you're expending money for a business that you're not yet in, is that deductible? No, because your pre-opening expenses are not deductible. It's that your deduction starts from the moment you place the items in service, right? That you, you have to have a real business in place, and then you're going to get the deductions going forward. So, you know, on the exam, and they, they always ask these 179 questions and the uh, bonus depreciation questions. And I got, without reading the question yet, the answer is going to be it's all going to be deductible. Um, but you need to know the million dollar limitation is what I would say that you just have to remember. And then the chart that will be in the code for your bonus depreciation numbers. Uh, net operating loss, all right, the, the now frequently tested again, also comes in place, right? Net operating loss. For, for years we've had to deal with the fact that uh, Businesses have income, that businesses have years where they make money and they lose money. The net operating loss deduction was designed to ameliorate the harshness of the annual accounting system, right? The, the problem with the net operating loss deduction, if there was a problem, is they say that if you look at all taxes paid by C corporations, um, that most of it the IRS ends up giving that companies make money for years and then they lose money and the net operating loss kind of nets it out. So the net operating loss carried back has been a very expensive item 
in taxes, right? Because it's a business makes money, it pays taxes, then it loses money, the IRS gives the money back. Okay. So what has changed in the net operating loss? All right. Um, so on, in practice and test, the net operating loss is when you, you go back, you still have to prove the net operating loss in the year that the loss was incurred. So say you carry forward a loss and the statute of limitations for the loss year has expired. But the IRS is, is, is looking at a year today where you've claimed that loss. The IRS is allowed to look at the original year, even if the statute of limitation had expired, in making the decision as to whether or not the deduction on this year's return is allowable. So the, the lesson there is that whenever you take a net operating loss, you need to keep the records to substantiate the loss until you fully utilize the loss. And that's going to become more important today because there's, we're going to talk about the change that losses are always going to be carried forward as opposed to carried back. So in terms of your rules of how long you need to keep records or how long your clients need to keep records, if there is a loss return, you want to keep those records until three years after the loss is fully utilized. All right? So forget about the three-year rule about keeping records. It's three years after you have fully used the loss. So the example, you have a loss in 2010. You carry that loss and it's being used on your 2017 return. IRS says, hey, we want to audit the loss on your 2017 return. And you will say, the statute of limitations for 2010, the year I took the loss, that expired. And I don't have those records anymore. Who wins that case? The IRS. The IRS. Because they're not auditing the 2010 year. They're auditing your use of the loss from the 2010 year on your 2017 return, and it is the taxpayer's burden of proof to prove that loss. Right. So that's a frequently, that, that issue comes up in practice, and people get very frustrated because the IRS is auditing a year where the records are lost or gone, and or that nobody saved them. But it is, you, it is the taxpayer's job and the tax professional's job to remind the taxpayer that those records need to be kept. Just carrying them over from year to year to year isn't a defense for when the IRS wants to audit that loss. Okay, so what did Congress do to the net operating loss? Right. One, the net operating loss, oh, is it 100% loss? Are we able to take 100% of our net operating losses going forward? No. No. Only 80%. Why? Because that's how they scored the bill. They needed to, so you, so we're not 100% protecting and saying, all right, we're going to ameliorate the effects of the annual accounting system. We accelerate income, we defer deductions, and, excuse me, to the extent that mismatch results in tax in some years and a loss in other years, your NOL is only going to be 80%. When is that effective? December 31, 2017, right? So going forward, our losses are not as valuable as they were, right? Think of it this way. If you've got a C corporation, and what's the new rate on the C corporation? So if you were able to carry that back, what were the rates before this year? So those NOLs were much more valuable before this new law. Because now we're only going to use the NOLs at the 21%, <laughs> as opposed to the 37 or the, the, the older rates. The 80% apply for the C The 80%. Yes? Frank, doesn't this mean that in the, in the subsequent year, whatever the income is for the year, you're only going to get 80% and you're going to pay some current You're going to pay tax. some tax. You can't. Right. I'm going to utilize the entire NOL. Limit to 80% of taxable income. I'm sorry. 
It's 80% of taxable income. So we're, it's kind of like alternative minimum tax. Mm -hmm. Even though you got a deduction, you can't use it all. No, no, there's still going to be zero returns. You just have to be more creative. Uh, uh, what? You think the zero return is going away? The zero tax return? Come on! Yes? I'm sorry, this is a little unclear. So, 80% can be used in, in one year? No, all of it. 20% um, is carried by I said it wrong. You can't reduce your income by your full net operating loss. You could only reduce 80% of your income. You're going to pay tax on your income in the gain year, notwithstanding the fact that the loss carried forward would have eliminated that impact tax liability. So you didn't really lose the loss. You didn't lose the loss. You're paying tax even though you had a loss. That's right. You didn't lose the loss. You just got to wait forever to take all your loss. Or so you have income. Right. You have to have income to use your loss. Or the 20 years. Right. So again, the theory is you accelerate income, you defer deductions. Right, but yes, no. It's 80% of taxable income without regard to the deduction. Right. Yes. You lost? Yes. The question? I'm sorry. You mentioned 80%, right? Right. But then the fact that there's a different rate now, that's going to be another thing. Yeah. Well, you can't really complain that the rate is lower. It's just yeah. that the, the loss is not as valuable. But the income isn't taxed as much. So, I mean, well, we're always complaining because everybody wants zero. <laughs> no, really, what everybody wants is a refund. <laughs> but now the refund scenario is less likely. It's pay less. So the two-year carryback, the carrybacks are gone. For now, they will probably come back. But for now, the carrybacks are gone. So the government isn't giving back money it's already collected. You're only going to reduce your future income. So that means you have to earn money. And again, the, just the general rules are what are normally tested on the exam. So you remember the general rule, the 80%, the no carryback, that should be enough for those of you who are taking the exam. And again, on examination, I mean, on, on IRS examinations, you're just going to know that there's not going to be any more carrybacks. Yes, Ted? And the if, you would, if anybody's around to be able to use the loss for 20 years, a business is losing money. All right. What's an activity for profit? All right, 183. You can't deduct expenses of a hobby or nonprofit activity. Right? So how do you know if an activity is for profit or not for profit? Right? Um, theoretically it's a subjective test that is evaluated on objective standards. I know that's a, a hard thing to get, right? The, the what the tax court looks at, what the IRS looks at is, did your taxpayer go into this business with the honest objective of making money? All right. A lot of the cases are taxpayers bought horses, and they like riding horses, but the crown can come any time. Yes, right there, okay, you could win the Triple Crown at any time, yeah. right? And that could happen, but, but there comes a point. What if you, haven't, if, you've had, if you haven't sold a horse for 20 years? Do you think 20 years of losses could be enough? 
But there is status, but the land can work some money. <laughs> And it is. It, 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 it's a subjective trust. I'm not going to tell somebody that they're in the business to make money or not make money. But that's what the tax court is going to look at. They're going to look at the way the business was conducted. And from the way the taxpayer conducted the business, did it appear that they had an actual and honest objective of making a profit. So what do they look at? And they, no one factor is issue determinative. They look at all the factors to decide, did this taxpayer have an honest objective of making a business? So what do they look at? The way the taxpayer did the business was, was, was the person there. Did they put in the hours? Did they, um, did the taxpayer have any expertise in doing this, right? The, the, Sometimes you've got the restaurant cases where somebody opens a restaurant, but he's never been in the restaurant business before. Um, how much time and effort did the taxpayer expend? Uh, the expectation that the assets used in the activity would appreciate and value, and that's Jacob's case, right? Maybe I wasn't going to make money on the horses, but the land that the horses were on. It was a case they tax. Yes, that was a case. That right. It was 20 years of losses, but the land went up in value. Um, the success of the taxpayer in carrying on uh, similar and dissimilar activities. The taxpayer's history of income and losses with respect to the activity. The amount of occasional profits, if ever. The financial status of the taxpayer and whether or not there was personal presence or, or recreation. So the doctor who's got lots of other income that has, you know, that wants to ride the horses, okay? They would say, hey, that's not a business. That's his personal pleasure. It's, he wants his daughter to ride horses. He wants to ride horses. That's pleasure. He, he didn't run the business in a way that indicated there was an objective to make money. On the other hand, I've seen the IRS apply um, 183 to restaurants, right? Nobody really goes into the restaurant business to lose money, or car washes. Or, so you, you look at, what? That's what I would say. Well, if you have a history of, well, so it's, it's easy either one or the other. Car one, washes where ex-IRS agents go to work because it's cash. Mm, uh, that's bad. <laughs> Well, again, what, what, what's the trigger of these audits? What, what's the trigger of these audits, right? How many have you seen Schedule C's that have never shown a profit? Yeah. Well, you're laughing, but I mean, when, when you look at 10 or 15 years of the taxpayer always having more expenses than they're reporting in income. When do you say that that honest intention to make a profit goes away? If they didn't have other income and there wasn't a deduction available, would the taxpayer still be engaged in this business? If you measure the income that's generated by the business and the taxpayer is making less than minimum wage, on what you see on his or her Schedule C. Is that really an honest intent to make a profit if he or she could earn so much more doing something else? Does stupid count? Yes, stupid does count. It's an honest intention to make a profit. So yes, you could be stupid and still have a profit motive. <laughs> but you can't be willfully blind to the fact that you can never generate a profit. And the, the one of the most interesting area where the IRS used profit motive was in tax shelters, right? But forget about the, the restaurant and the business, and you could say, hey, plausible deniability, right? But a lot of these tax shelters, where you, uh, when you donate, you, when you contribute $10, and you get a deduction of $70, you're indifferent to whether or not the business makes money because the tax savings have generated 
a better rate of return than any other investment activity than you could have entered into, right? And that's when the IRS is very successful. They're saying, this isn't a business. There was really no separate and apart from the tax benefits that were obtained from investing in this activity, right? The debt that you're, that, that you're using that creates the leverage isn't real. It was never a genuine expectation that you were going to pay it back. It was just, um, the, 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 instead of a profit motive, the motive was to get tax deductions or to have items that you would use the deductions against your other income. So the, the answer in your, uh, in your practice, in your audits, right, is the, the first question is going to be, um, you know, did they ever show profit, right? Because there's a safe harbor. If they showed profit in three of the five years or two of seven years, uh, if it's horse breeding, training, showing, et cetera, what's going on? Oh. <laughs> I may be the victim of counterfeiting. The horses are fighting back. <laughs> Delivery updates aren't working. Orange is next to the next one. That's the scam. You can get out of 183, right? Uh, and there are forms that you can file to postpone the determination. If you're in the beginning and you're audited, there's a form that you can file to postpone of home when the IRS makes the determination of did you have a profit or you actually have a hindsight test go in there. But in the majority of these cases, it comes down to your proof. You, you look at those factors, you say, what did the taxpayers do? Did they actually keep books and records? Right? Who did they employ to do the business? And it comes out to be a know it when you see it type case. The good thing is, uh, right, we, we've got the cases, the, um, the IRS loses a lot of the profit motive cases, right? It, because it is a subjective intent, a taxpayer that gets on the witness stand and explains what he or she did in order to make a profit is going to be believed. Right? Because to the extent that they've spent real money and they've spent time in the activity and they've advertised or done anything that makes it look like a business, they could be a dummy and they could lose money. Because what's the, the, the real fact is that most small businesses fail. Right? Even with the best of intentions, how many small businesses fail? So that line between the taxpayer who failed because they, they didn't have a real profit motive or that taxpayer who just like bought that franchise and shouldn't have been in that business to begin with is, is very hard to, to judge, right? Essentially, you're, you have to say that the taxpayer lied. We caught them in a lie. As long as you tell the story, and you have your documents to back up your profit motive case, you're going to be successful. You'll be successful in appeals or you'll be successful in tax rate. And this is one of those few areas where I see exam sets the issue up much more frequently than the facts would support setting it up. The exam looks at the objective facts. You have three or more years where you didn't make any money and they just say no profit motive and that's when advocacy really comes in and a lot of these cases settle remember profit motive cases are not all or nothing and there are settlements that you could do with appeals that will take the losses up to today but then will stop taking the losses so it doesn't cost the taxpayer any money so profit settling profit motive losses cases representing taxpayers in profit loss cases is where you can make a difference on the other hand, you're preparing returns. Think twice about it. I mean, if you're representing a client for 10 years in a row and there hasn't been a profit, you got to start thinking, when have I gone over the line? Right? And I don't have answers for that, right? It's not up to you. 
to judge the client. It's not up to you to say, hey, client, you're lying to me. You don't really have a profit motive, right? And the, the ethical rules don't really let you do that. But there comes a point where the audit risk is just too high for years and years of losses. Where, where are they? You're seeing the profit motive cases. You're seeing it on the individuals on the Schedule Cs. You're seeing it in S corporations, partnerships, and trust in the states. Anything that flows through to the income tax return is a potential case for a profit motive. Like we said, the shelters are your K-1s. Can, the losses can be disallowed for profit motive. You're, you're seeing it. The yacht racing, right? You, a couple of guys get together. You're going to buy a yacht, but we're also going to charter it out once or twice a year. Or the private plane that you're going to charter. Well, tax shelter, profit motive, deduction, hobby. I mean, those are all the same thing. You're trying to take a tax deduction for something that's really not a trade or business. And that's all it is, right? That you, that you, the reason you purchase the asset is not to make money. The reason you purchase the asset is because you get some measure of personal enjoyment or pleasure from the asset. That's the yacht, that's the airplane, that's the um, horse farm. The, it's not a trader business. You didn't intend to make money, right? Uh, there are a lot of these motion picture cases that, and, or Broadway plays that if you look at the agreements, that no matter how much money you, the movie makes, it could never make a profit, right? When I was with the Internal Revenue Service, I worked a case involving the movie Conan versus the Barbarian, right? Most people would think that Conan versus the Barbarian was a very profitable movie. But we ran numbers that said no matter how much the movie made, and Conan was more successful than it ever was supposed to be, but there was no set of facts that even if it had done Star Wars numbers, there was no way, based on the way the agreements were written, that the investors would even get back their money. Right? There was no profit motive. It was back then you had income forecast depreciation methods where the write-off was. Five times the investment was written off on a return right away. Right? That's how you, you evaluate that there is no profit objective and you shouldn't be taking loss. And again, this profit motive, what is profit motive? What is a hobby? They will give you facts on the exam that, that, make, that suggest the answer to the question, or they will just ask you to describe the profit motive rules. And just remember, subjective test, honest intention to make a profit. Right. Tra last item we want to cover tonight is travel expenses because that business, uh, travel and entertainment expenses. Travel hasn't changed. It's still subject to 274D. Entertainment expenses have changed. So as we, we always would group travel and entertainment expenses together, we're going to start having to think of them as separately now because the rules have changed. Now, we start with, uh, in order to deduct travel, you have to come up with the heightened substantiation of 274. One of the primary reasons for that is to take commuting out of the deduction for travel and entertainment expenses. The bulk of the cases, the bulk of what you're going to see in when you're preparing returns and in the IRS examinations of returns and in the cases involve taxpayers who are trying to convert their everyday travel back and forth to work, which is designated as a commuting expense, into a deductible expense. So that's the overall theme. When you're looking at the deduction on the return, when you're looking at representing the taxpayer in the audit before the tax court, you say, how is this taxpayer getting to and from his tax home, his place of employment? That is commuting, and that part should never be deductible. 
And that's how you will settle the cases as well. If you are able to back out commuting and demonstrate what isn't commuting, that's the basis for the deduction. Or you will sometimes hear of it as the five-sevenths rule, right? But let, let's look at it. What do you need in order to prove a travel expense? You need to have uh, records sufficient to corroborate, right? Which, not prove, right? Corroborate is the taxpayer's testimony is what proves the expense. Corroboration is what documents will help support the taxpayer's testimony. Okay. It's also uh, contemporaneous. You would think so. But let's... <laughs> The, the, it is not unusual for an appeals officer or an examiner to say, okay, the diary itself doesn't have to be contemporaneous. It's the records that are used to create the diary have to be contemporaneously kept. And that is, that's tested in both the substantive part of the exam and it's tested in the rules of evidence. Right? It's the records that you're using to create the summary have to be contemporaneously maintained. And that more and more people are using <coughs> their software programs that they put in your phone and in your, tel uh, your uh, car, like Mile IQ, that keeps those records. And then you would take the data that's created by those that's apps that's right. and then put them into your business records and that contemporaneous data, even if not put into your business records contemporaneously, will support the deduction and will satisfy the substantiation rule. So the, you've got to be aware, like again, they test it on the evidence section of the exam, what needs to be contemporaneous. And what's got to be contemporaneous is the data that is used to create the summary or the diary. Okay, so what you need to have is the amount of the expenditure, right? So a reconstruction based on the credit card usage, right? Because the credit card expense is contemporaneous, will give you the amount, the dates of the departure and the return, right? Sometimes if it, it's travel, it could be something as computer generated like the Easy Pass, which has the dates and the amounts. And you can you can extrapolate the mileage from the distance on the tolls, then the place and destination by city and again the mile IQs, the <clears throat> Easy Pass, the credit cards at the gas station help you reconstruct that pit. And the the business reason for the expected travel, the contemporaneous emails confirming that you're coming out for the meeting. <coughs> Would be would explain that this was the business travel that was going to be there. The letters, all of the objective facts. State of mind. What? State of mind. It, it's really more than a state of mind because it's you're confirming with the other party that this was the business person of the travel. All right. Mike Wallace is ending me, so we're going to end now, and we're going to go over the change to entertainment expenses starting next month when we finish substantiating deductions. Thank you very, very much. Some I have. Um, tonight's course, we're going to try to go the topic that we announced is substantiating deductions. The biggest issue on audits is substantiating deductions. Deductions are a matter of legislative grace. So the, the topic becomes more complicated because the audits we're doing all involve years prior to 2018, where there were a different set of statutes, right? The returns that you're going to prepare now for 2017 are going to involve the old law. 
But for those of you who are taking the tax court admission exam in November of this year, it is more likely than not that you will be tested on the new law. So what we're going to try to do, yeah, Maria, you're looking at me and saying, how am I going to remember the old law versus the new law? And we're going to have to hope that the, the people who are writing this year's exam are, are, are not cruel, right? And, and give you old effective dates, and they'll say effective 2018. So, but what we're going to try to go over tonight is mostly the new law. And, but to the extent that there is something that has changed, right, I'll have to describe what the change was and what the old law was. Louder, please. All right. Louder, can you hear me? All right. So now we're going to, so substantiating deductions. So that's what we're going to talk about. Now, again, as I always say, on substance, we're going four classes. Right? So you, we're not going to cover all of substance that you have to know for the tax court's admission exam tonight. Tonight, we're going to start with the deduction section. And for those of you who are on the Google group and have been looking at the grades, you can see that more than half of the deduction sections that have been frequently tested by the Internal Revenue Service have changed. So uh, I'm going to commend to you the materials. I'm going to commend to you the, the grids that we publish on the Google group. And I understand that the studying for the exam, for those of you who are working on exams, are going to be difficult. And it's even going to be more confusing for those of you who are handing, handling audits, because audits are always historical. And we're going to be dealing with old law versus new law. Okay? So let's start. And uh, the way I've tried to organize it is by the pages of the return, right? So this isn't going to be by code section. We're going to try to go over from the beginning of the return through the return where you would look at what's changed. All right, now. It's on. Okay. Substantiation in general. Substantiation in general has not changed, OK? What are the requirements for substantiation? Substantiation is that the taxpayer has to keep books and records that are adequate to examine the items that are on the return. Right? What does that mean? That means that the taxpayer knows what he or she spent. The Internal Revenue Service is auditing and verifying that what the taxpayer claims he or she spent on an allowed item was indeed spent and spent on that item. So when we talk about substantiation, we're really talking about quantum of proof. Okay. So uh, how do you corroborate the taxpayer's records? Sometimes corroboration is used by industry standards. Um, that in addition to looking at taxpayers' book and records, you should always apply common sense, right? You prepare lots of returns. You know what norms are. When a taxpayer's deductions are outside of those norms, that's when you should be asking more questions. Because when things don't make sense, there is generally a problem. And that, that whether it's the people preparing the returns, or the IRS people that are examining the returns. They look for things that are outside the normal course, right? Also, there are certain areas of the code that Congress has identified as abuse areas. Those abuse areas, the Congress has enacted what are called enhanced substantiation requirements. Those enhanced substantiation requirements are generally in Section 274. The, the Congress has said, you know, when it comes to meals and entertainments, taxpayers will sometimes fluff that they, they will try to take personal meals and make them into business items, travel, gifts, and certain types of listed property are subject to enhanced substantiation. And we're going to go through those. Now, and 
for audits and for the exam, we're going to go through the new 274. On enhanced substantiation, what I want to remind you from audit through appeals through trial, there are issues of proof. There are appeals officers that will allow and settle cases, even if your substantiation is not perfect and does not meet the standards of 274, because they believe that your books and records are adequate to substantiate the expense or that you're credible. There are exceptions, right? This year we have lots of cases involving natural disasters and hurricanes. How would you expect a taxpayer that was involved in a natural disaster to substantiate the records if the natural disaster destroyed the records, right? So there, of course, there are exceptions in those cases if you can demonstrate by third-party sources what the averages are. So in terms of the exam, I want you to know the 274 sections. In terms of preparing returns, you should ask the, the taxpayers you know, what they have. Do they satisfy the enhanced substantiation of the 274? In terms of your representation practice, I tell you reconstruct. Get the best estimate. Section, right, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights uh, says that the goal of the Internal Revenue Service is to collect the correct tax. To the extent that you can put together proofs that establish the correct tax, then appeals will frequently overlook the technical standards in 274. Okay. So, back to deductions in general. Taxpayer is the burden of proof. All right? and, and you're going to see that in all of the cases. Why is the, that? Because the taxpayer is the one that knows what went into the boxes. They've given you the source data, you've put them in the right boxes of the, on the return. Putting the burden of proof on the government 